In this video, I will go over Chapter 2, Problems and Exercises. Before we start, though, I want to do a quick little review of some important concepts that we learned during the lecture. So the first thing is the accounting change equation. We learned that the change in assets equals the change in liabilities plus the change in owner's equity, which is comprised of the change in common stock plus the change in retained earnings. But the change in retained earnings is just net income minus dividends but net income is revenue minus expense. So this was the accounting change equation. This part, of course, is the change in retained earnings. And of course, all of this is the change in owner's equity. Change in assets equals change in liabilities plus change in owner's equity. But we can break it down this way. So this equation is very helpful to remember. The next thing that we need to remember are the six categories that any account that a company has will be in. An account will either be classified as a dividend, an expense, an asset, or it'll be classified as a liability, an owner's equity account, or revenue account. And you remember the acronym that we used last time to remember these six categories was dealer. Now you may notice here, you may wonder why do we have dividends, expenses, and revenue listed separately from owner's equity when clearly you can see up here in the equation that revenue, expense, and dividends all affect owner's equity. Well, we, that's just the way we, we differentiate a dividend, an expense, and revenue separate. Owner's equity then is just going to be common stock or retained earnings. These are the two owner's equity accounts. Now it is true that revenue, expense, and dividends, these three accounts do affect retained earnings. Clearly they affect retained earnings. You can see that the change in retained earnings equals revenue minus expense minus dividends. And because they affect retained earnings, they definitely affect owner's equity. But we're going to keep them separate in terms of categorizing accounts. You should remember that, I mean, just looking right here, you can see that holding, if we hold expenses and dividends constant and we increase re revenue, what happens to retained earnings? It goes up. If we hold revenue and dividends constant, what happens to expense, well, and we increase expenses, what happens to retained earnings? It goes down. And if we hold revenue and expense constant and we increase dividends, what happens to retained earnings? It goes down because of the minus sign here. So anything that makes retained earnings go up makes owner's equity go up because there's a positive relationship between retained earnings and owner's equity. And anything that makes 
Retained earnings go down, makes owner's equity go down. So the summary of this is when revenue goes up, that makes retained earnings go down. I'm sorry, makes retained earnings go up, which makes owner's equity increase. And when expenses go up, that makes retained earnings go down, which makes owner's equity go down. And then when dividends go up, that makes retained earnings go down. Dividends are paid out of retained earnings, which makes owner's equity go down. This, this information right here is usually uh, tricky for students to remember. So if we have an account, we know it can be classified in, as one of these six. Any account the company has will be in one of these six categories, and it can only be in one of the six. These categories are mutually exclusive. If the account happens to fall in um, one of the D, E, or A categories, like for example, take cash, which is an asset, then if we make a T account for cash, which we can make a T account for any account, since cash falls in the D, E, or A category, in this case A, the rules of debit and credit are an entry on the left-hand side of the account, otherwise known as the debit side of the account, increases the account's balance, and an entry on the right-hand side of the account, otherwise known as a credit, decreases the account's balance. If the account in question happens to fall into one of the other three categories though, for example, let's take accounts payable, which is a liability. We make a T account for accounts payable. Since accounts payable falls in one of these other three categories, an entry on the left-hand side of the account, so a debit entry will decrease the account's balance, and an entry on the right hand of the account, right hand side of the account will increase the account's balance. So these are the rules of debit and credit. We abbreviate debit with DR and credit with CR in accounting. So with all these pieces of information in mind, let's work th through some Chapter 2 homework problems or some problems and exercises from Chapter 2. So I'm going to go to the ebook here, hit read, and I'm going to try to pick problems that um, will help your understanding the most of the material. Go over here to Chapter 2. We're going to start with exercises set A. And we're going to work some exercises in set A. I'm going to skip the first one because I think that that's uh, pretty straightforward. And then I guess we'll work on the second one. It says, following the example that they show you in the first one, A, part A, indicate the accounting effects of the listed transactions on assets, liabilities, and owner's equity. In other words, describe what happens to the accounting equation. So let's start with part B here. And for each of these, we're taking the accounting equation and we're trying to determine what happens to the accounting equation. So what I would do is for each of these transactions, I would first figure out what accounts are involved. So in part B, rendered services and build the client. 
The word rendered means we performed the services. And gap says we have to recognize revenue when we earn it. And they defined that we earned revenue whenever we've performed the services or rendered the services or we've shipped the goods to the customer. So since we've performed the services, we have to recognize revenue. So we can definitely we definitely know that revenue is involved. So revenue is one of the accounts. Since it's called services here, we'll call it service revenue. If it said shipped goods instead of rendered services, we would call it sales revenue. The second part of the sentence, and build the client, tells us the other account that's involved. And build the client. So they didn't pay us any cash, so cash isn't involved, but they owe us. That's called an account receivable. So these are the two accounts involved, service revenue and accounts receivable. Accounts receivable, our service revenue goes up because we did the services for the client. We've earned the revenue. So revenue is up. And then we are owed, we are owed money from these people that we did the for whom we did the services and so accounts receivable just represents money owed to us for services that we provided to the customer or for goods that we've shipped to the customer so this goes up as well we haven't received any cash yet from them um, but this is what's happened so accounts receivable what part of the accounting equation does this affect Accounts receivable is an asset. So when accounts receivable goes up, that increases assets. What part of the accounting equation does service revenue affect? Right up here. Remember this? Revenues affect owner's equity. So when revenue goes up, retained earnings goes up, which makes owner's equity go up. No effect on liabilities. Let's go to the next one. Paid rent for the month. Anytime you see the word paid, cash was involved. It means we gave up cash. So we know cash is one of the accounts involved. And we know that it went down because it says paid and paid rent for the month. Usually rent is prepaid, but it didn't say that we paid it at the beginning of the month here, so we're gonna assume that we just paid it um, when we, when we um, owed it, or when we, um, at the end of the month, we're gonna assume. But usually um, rent is paid at the beginning of the month and it will tell you paid rent for the upcoming month or something to let you know that it was to let you know for sure that you paid it at the beginning but in this particular one they're just assuming that you paid it at the end so the other account that's involved is going to be rent expense so I'll go through both scenarios if you happen to pay the rent at the end of the month so you've lived in the place, the landlord let you live in the place or let you occupy the place for the month. And then at the end of the month, they trust you to pay them and you pay them at the end of the month. Then the two accounts involved are cash and rent expense. Cash goes down and rent expense goes up. Rent expense, the reason expenses go up here, if you paid at the end of the month, um, if this trans if C is happening at the end of the month, the reason expenses are involved is you have to remember the definition of an expense. So expenses, GAP says expenses should be recognized when they are incurred. And expenses incurred whenever you derive the benefit from using an asset. So in this case, if this happens to be at the end of the month, we've, the, we've derived the benefit from being able to occupy the space for this month. Therefore, we've incurred an expense. 
Cash is an asset. So since cash goes down, assets go down. Liabilities are not affected. Rent expense affects owner's equity. Remember over here, expenses, when they go up, retained earnings goes down, which makes owner's equity go down. Right? Because expenses are right here. And the minus sign means they have a they have a decreasing effect on owner's equity. So that would be the effect on the accounting equation if we assume that Part C happens at the end of the month. What if we assume that we paid the rent at the beginning of the month and not at the end of the month? So we paid the rent for the space that we're going to occupy, but we do it before we occupy the space. We do it at the beginning of the month, which is usually how rent is. Well, then we cannot recognize an expense at the beginning of the month because we haven't occupied the space yet. We haven't derived the benefit from, from using the asset. And until we've done that, we haven't incurred an expense. Remember, remember again, GAP says expenses should be recognized when they are incurred. And an expense is incurred when we derive the benefit from using an asset. If we haven't derived the benefit from using the asset, we haven't incurred an expense. Even though we have paid cash for the asset, we haven't derived the benefit from using the asset yet. We haven't incurred the expense. So if C happened at the beginning of the month, cash would definitely go down. But the other account involved would be the asset account, prepaid rent. And prepaid rent would go up. Prepaid rent is an asset. It represents the dollar value of the right to occupy a space in the future. And that dollar value or that right to occupy this space in the future has just gone up. So the effect on the accounting equation, so liabilities would not be affected, owner's equity would not be affected. The cash going down would make assets go down. Prepaid rent going up would make assets go back up by the same amount because prepaid rent is an asset. And so the net effect on assets of this uh, would be no effect. So the net effect is assets, no effect, liabilities, no effect, owner's equity, no effect. Or you could say liabilities, no effect, owner's equity, no effect, then assets goes up and then down by the same amount. Either way. This is what usually would, would happen. Um, we would pay the rent at the beginning of the month. So this would be the answer if we paid it at the beginning of the month. D, rendered services to a client in exchange for cash. Well, the word rendered, or the, the, the phrase rendered services means we've earned revenue, right? Just like in part B. So definitely revenue is involved, in this case service revenue. And then the other account involved, it's pretty clear. They told us we rendered the services for cash. So cash is the other account involved. Service revenue goes up. Cash goes down. Cash is an asset, so that makes assets go down. Service revenue does not affect liabilities, does not affect assets. It affects owner's equity. Oh, cash doesn't go down. What am I what am I thinking here? We rendered services to a client. So revenue goes up in exchange for them giving us cash. We don't pay cash, they give us cash. So cash goes up, which makes assets go up. Sorry about that. And then service revenue going up makes owner's equity go up. Recall Recall up here again, this part E, received the amount due from, a, from the client in transaction B. So in B, we rendered services and we billed the client. So in B, we rendered services, so service revenue went up and they didn't pay us, but they owe us money. So our accounts receivable goes up. 
Now in part E, they pay off their account receivable with us. How do they pay off their account receivable? They give us cash, right? So cash is involved and it goes up from our perspective. We get cash from them. And the other account involved is the account receivable that we have with our customer. And since they just paid it off, do we, do we have any more account receivable with them? Or do we expect to receive money from them in the future for the services that we've rendered in the past? No, they just paid us for those services. So they just paid off their account receivable. So the accounts receivable goes down. So the increase in cash makes assets go up. The decrease in accounts receivable makes assets go down by the same amount. These, these accounts are both assets. Liability is not affected, owner's equity not affected. And the equation stays in balance. Part F, we purchase an office desk on account. It did not say, the, it did not have the word paid here. It says purchased on account, which means we did not pay any cash. Um, it means we, we owe, we owe the supplier for the thing that they've given us. So in this case, the accounts involved are office equipment, and accounts payable. We bought office equipment from the supplier. We obtained office equipment. So the dollar value of our office equipment goes up. Office equipment is, is an asset, so that makes assets go up. And accounts payable, we now have this extra amount of money that we owe our supplier. And so our accounts payable, which is a liability, goes up. Any Anytime you see the word payable in, in, in an account title, that means it's a liability. Owner's equity not affected. Part G, we paid employees salaries for the month. You see the word paid, so the cash is definitely involved. And we paid their salary, so cash goes down, which makes assets go down. Liability is not affected. And then assuming they're assuming here that we pay their salaries right whenever they worked for us. So we have to recognize an expense whenever we incur the expense, according to GAP, and we incur an expense when we derive the benefit from using an asset. I've said this, this is the third or fourth time I've said this in the video. Once our employees work for us, we've derived benefit, right? What's the benefit of us having an employee if they don't work for us? There is no benefit. We hire them so they work for us, and we compensate them in return for them working for us. So once they've worked for us, we have incurred an expense because we derive the benefit of them working for us. Stuff got done in the, in the factory. So salaries expense in this case has been incurred. And that goes up. So we're assuming here in part G that we are paying our employees exactly when they work for us at the same time, which usually doesn't happen. Usually they work for us. We incur the salaries expense and we have the related salaries payable, we owe them we owe them their salary, and then later we pay off that payable. But right here, it's just assuming that they're working for us and we're paying them instantly, instantaneously. Every little microsecond they work for us, we're paying them. That's what it's assuming, which is not a reasonable assumption, but it um, that's what they're assuming here. So the increase in the expense here, again, expenses affect owner's equity. They, they affect owner's equity through retained earnings. When expenses go up, retained earnings goes down, which makes owner's equity go down. So this increase in salaries expense makes owner's equity go down. The equation stays in balance. H, we paid for the desk that we purchased in F. Remember, remember that desk we, we got from our, our supplier that we didn't pay for? Well, now we're paying for it. So we're paying off this account payable that we have in F. So the two accounts involved here are cash and accounts payable. I'm going to abbreviate it as AP. Cash goes down. 
We have to, we're paying we're paying the suppliers. We're paying them cash. Cash goes down from our perspective. And why are we you know what are we gaining by paying them cash? They're they're telling us that we no longer owe them any more money. So the account payable is the dollar value of what we owe them. So that goes down. So assets go down because cash is an asset and it went down and liabilities go down because accounts payable is a liability and it went down. We just satisfied some of our liabilities. Owner's equity not affected. The equation stays in balance. And then finally, I, the company paid a dividend. So we pay a dividend. The two accounts involved are cash. It goes down. We're giving cash to our shareholders. Again, our shareholders, our owners, they're separate from us as a company. The, the entity, the company, is separate from its owners. So cash, from our, from our perspective, from the company's perspective, cash goes down. And then dividends is the other account involved. Dividends goes up. How does dividends affect the accounting equation? It affects owner's equity, right? It's up here again. Remember this box. When dividends go up, that makes retained earnings go down, which makes owner's equity go down. Dividends are paid out of retained earnings, and anything that affects retained earnings affects owner's equity. So that's the effect on the accounting equation of this transaction. And that's exercise 2-2A. Let's think about another one. Let's do exercise 2-3A. For this one, they give us the account, they give us the beginning balance in the account and the ending balance in the account, and they give us some other information that affects that account during the period. And then down here in the unknowns, they ask us for the unknown amount. So anytime you are given a beginning and ending balance for an account, if you're, giving, if you're given anything about the balance in an account at any moment in time, whether the beginning of the period or the end of the period, make a T account. So for this first transaction, which they did for us, but we'll go ahead and do it anyway since it'll illustrate, we're going to make a T account for cash. Cash's beginning balance is 7000 and its ending balance is 5250 On which side of the T do we put the beginning and the ending balance? We put it, for cash, we put it, on the left hand side, on the debit side. Cash has a normal debit balance. If we go back to the rules of debit and credit, dividend, expense, and asset accounts all have normal debit balances. So an account's normal balance is either a debit or a credit, whichever one you do to increase the account. So for dividends, expenses, and asset accounts, they are increased with debits. So these accounts have normal debit balances. But for liabilities, owner's equity, and revenue accounts, how do you increase these accounts? You increase them with a credit. So these accounts have normal credit balances. So cash, it told us the beginning balance is 7000 and the ending balance is 5250 so those must both be over here on the debit side. So this is the BB, the beginning balance. This is the EB, the ending balance. And then it tells us here other information Total cash dispersed, 5400 during the period of time, whether it's a month or a year. The word dispersed means paid, paid out, which means cash went down by 5400 How do we make cash go down? Do we credit it or do we debit it? Well, according to the rules of debit and credit, to make cash go down, we credit it because it's one of these three accounts, one of these types of accounts. 
So to, to show that disbursement, we would have credited cash for what, 5,400? And the question is, does 7,000 minus 5,400 equal 5,250? No. 7,000 minus 5,400 equals 1,600. But the ending balance is 5,250. So we must have added some more stuff to the cash T account this period. We, we must have received some cash this period. So X is the amount of cash we received this period. So for any T account, the following, following equation holds. Beginning balance minus the stuff that you subtract from the account plus the stuff that you add to the account has to equal the ending balance. That holds for any T account. So if we solve this equation for X, we'll find that X equals um, 5250 minus 1600, which they did it for us, but we'll just go ahead and do it. 3,650 and that's how they got here total cash received 3,650 let's do part B the account in question here is accounts receivable it's an asset so it's a DE it's an A so the beginning balance is 11 the ending balance is 9.3 and we know that's on the debit side because Asset accounts have normal debit balances. So 11 and 9.3. Ending balances are usually have a, a line over them and a double underline to let us know that's the ending balance in the account. And then they tell us that during the period we provided services for a client and they didn't pay us for those services. Um, we provided those services on account, 16,500. Well, that increases accounts receivable. These are the services provided on account. So, so accounts receivable goes up by 60. They owe us 16,500 more than what they previously owed us after we did those services for them. Previous to that, they owed us 11,000. Then we did some services for them and we billed them 16,500. Now they owe us an additional 16,500. And at the end of the period, they only owe us 9,300. So does the beginning balance plus 16,500 equal 9,300? No. There must be... We must have reduced accounts receivable by, by some amount this period. And the question is, how much did we reduce it by? The only way that accounts receivable goes down is when we collect from our customers. When we collect cash from our customers, they pay off their account receivable. Then the accounts receivable goes down by, by X. So we can solve for X. 11,000 beginning balance plus the additions to the account minus the subtractions from the account has to equal the ending balance. So this implies X equals 9,300 minus 16,500 minus 11,000. Well, actually, I didn't do that right. If we put X over here on the right-hand side and the 9,300 on the left-hand side, so X equals 11,000 plus 16,500 minus 9,300. So 18,200 is X. This is the cash received from customers who are paying off their account. So total cash collected from credit customers, 18,200. Part C, they give us notes payable. They give us the beginning balance and the ending balance.
Beginning balance in notes payable is 17.5. Ending balance is 23. Now, what type of an account is notes payable? What category is it in? If we go back here to our rules of debit and credit. Notes payable is a liability. Any account with payable in the title is a liability. So notes payable has a normal credit balance. So the, the two balances they give us have to go on the right-hand side, the credit side. 17.5 and 23. So notes payable started the period with a balance of 17.5, ended the period with a balance of 23. I guess I don't have to write EB for this because a double underline means that's the ending balance. There's no need to be redundant. And then it tells us that we borrowed funds during the period by issuing a note. So this means that we went to the bank. The bank gave us $30,000 cash in exchange for us giving them a promise that we'll pay them back. That promise is called notes payable. So that means notes payable, this liability, increased by $30,000 this period. So we owed the bank at the beginning of the period $17,500 for money that we had borrowed from them in a previous period. Then during this period, we borrow an additional $30,000 from them. And at the end of this period, it says we owe the bank $23,000. Does $17,500 plus $30,000 equal $23,000? No. So we must have paid the bank some this period. We must have reduced accounts. Uh, re we must have reduced notes payable, right? Because seventeen thousand five hundred plus thirty thousand is a number bigger than twenty-three thousand. We need to, we need to subtract some from notes payable to get down to twenty-three thousand ending balance. So this right here is the amount that we've paid the bank back for the uh, for the previous loans that we owe them. So we can solve for that. Seventeen five. Beginning balance in the account plus the amounts added to the account minus the amount subtracted from the account has to equal the ending balance in the account. This equation holds for all T accounts. So solving this equation gives us x equals what? 17.5 plus 30 minus 23. or $24,500. This is um, cash paid to satisfy loans, to satisfy uh, loans that we've previously taken out from the bank. So I would guess, if we, if we assume like a first in, first out sort of assumption, this money we paid the bank this period, 17500 of it covers the what we owe them at the beginning of the period, and then whatever the difference is, um, knocks this down to 23000 left over owing them at the end of the period, if that makes sense. Let's do part D. Goods and services, all right, yes, yeah, so we did notes payable repay during the period. Accounts payable starts the period of the balance 25, ends the period with a balance of 17.2, or 1,720, sorry. So accounts payable, it is a liability, just like notes payable, so it has a normal credit balance. So these balances that they give us, we better put them on the right-hand side of the account. Um, and then it tells us during the period we paid we paid some of our accounts payable off three thousand nine hundred. When we ca when we pay off our accounts payable, right? We reduce our accounts payable, and to reduce a liability, you got to debit it according to the rules of debit and credit. When we pay off our accounts payable, that makes our accounts payable go down, and the way to do that is you debit the account as you see here. Does 2,500 minus 3,900 equal 1,720? No, 2,500 minus 3,900 equals negative 1,400. So there must be some addition that we made to accounts payable this period. In other words, we must have gotten some 
some stuff from a supplier that we didn't pay for, and so our accounts payable went up by X. So we can solve for it. 2,500 minus, so beginning balance minus the subtractions from the account plus the additions to the account has to equal the ending balance. That implies that X equals 1720 plus 3900 minus 2500. So 3120. So this is the dollar value in part D here, the dollar value of goods and services received from our suppliers that we didn't pay for. We have a liability, right, to pay for these things. And then finally, part E, so that's the answer to part D. And then E, it gives us stockholder's equity, a T account for stockholder's equity. And we know that owner's equity has a normal credit balance because it's L-O-R, it's O, right? So it has a normal credit balance. So these two balances are on the right-hand side of the T account. Beginning balance of 29, ending balance of 46. I should label this BB. I should label this BB. And then it told us during the period there was a capital contribution made by our shareholders of 7000 that means they gave us $7,000 in uh, cash. In exchange, we gave them $7,000 worth of, of shares of common stock. So that increases common stock by $7,000, which increases owner's equity by $7,000. Does $29,000 plus $7,000 equal $46,000? No, 29,000 plus 7,000 equals 36,000. And we still have an additional amount to add to owner's equity this period. So what else affects owner's equity? We know common stock affects it and we know retained earnings affects it. And so we can solve for X. 29,000 beginning balance plus the capital contribution. So that's the, this is the change in common stock right here. plus X, which will be the change in retained earnings, equals the ending balance of 46,000. So that means that X, that, Im that implies that X equals 46 minus 29 minus seven, or X equals $10,000. Right, beginning balance in common stock, I'm sorry, beginning balance in owner's equity, plus the two things that affect owner's equity in the period. So plus the change in common stock, plus the change in retained earnings equals the ending balance in owner's equity. And it looks like that here, X, the change in retained earnings is $10,000. And we know the change in retained earnings can be broken down into, if we go back up here, The change in retained earnings right here is um, revenue minus expense, which is net income, minus dividends. So the change in retained earnings equals $10,000, and that's the same thing as just net income minus dividends. And it says here, net income, assuming no dividends were paid, equals what? Well, this equals net income minus dividends. So if we assume that dividends are zero, then that means net income is 10,000. Right? 
let's work another one. Um, let me go. We haven't made any journal entries yet. I just want to do a transaction where we make some journal entries. So exercise 26A. Let's do exercise 26A. So now we want to make journal entries in this transaction. It says, Unique Designs, a firm providing art services for advertisers, began business on June 1st. The following T accounts and its general ledger are needed to record the transactions for June. So we're going to be using these T accounts and no other T accounts when we do the recording for these transactions. So in part A, we need to make we need to use the accounting equation, record each of the transactions in column in our format. That's what we were doing. That's what we were doing um, earlier up here. That's what we're doing like right here. It wants us to do that for each of these transactions. And then in part B, make the journal entry. So I'm going to do part B for each transaction. And then I'll, I'll do part A after I do part B. So I'll do for each transaction, I'll do part A, then I'll do part, I'll do part B, and then I'll do part A for that transaction. So on June 1st, Emily Holmes invests $8,000 to begin the business. The business is, is called Unique Designs. And in exchange, Unique Designs gives Emily Holmes, so Emily Holmes receives common stock from Unique Designs. So what's the, um, what's the journal entry for this transaction from Unique Designs perspective? Well, when making a journal entry, you go through a few steps. The first step is you figure out which accounts are involved. So we know the accounts involved are cash and common stock. Unique Designs is receiving cash from Emily Holmes and giving Emily Holmes common stock. First step, which accounts are involved? Second step, for each account involved, Figure out, does it go up or down in value? Well, we're Unique Designs and we just received cash. So clearly cash needs to go up in value. We're Unique Designs and we've given some common stock to Emily Holmes, which increases ownership in the company. Common stock represents the dollar value of ownership in the company. So common stock goes up. So that's the second step. The third step is, for each account involved, put it in the right category, D-E-A-L-O-R. So cash is an A, and common stock is an O. And then the, the final step to make the journal entry is, use the, re, use the rules of debit and credit to make the journal entry. So what account are we going to debit here? And what account are we going to credit? That's the question we're asking here. With any journal entry, there always will be at least one debit and at least one credit. So using the rules of debit and credit back here, cash is an asset and we said it went up. So how do we make an asset go up? We're going to have to debit cash. Common stock is an owner's equity account, so it's over here. And we said it went up. How are we going to make that happen? Debit or credit to common stock? Credit. So we're debiting cash and we're crediting common stock. So to make the journal entry, you always put the account that you're going to debit on top, the account that you're going to credit on bottom, and indented to the right. And then the amounts, which were $8,000, they told us. Usually you also include the date, June 1st. And then underneath, you include a one-sentence description of what happened. So we received cash in exchange for stock. So this 
is the, the complete journal entry for part B. Now throughout the course, all I really want for you, from you whenever I ask for a journal entry, I don't need the date and I don't need this one sentence description. All I need is this part. But in the company's records, when they make the journal entry, they have to have this whole thing. They have to have the date and the one sentence description. All right. Now, so this is uh, June 1st. I should have done this like this. So for June 1st, um, here's part B, the journal entry, and then here's part A. The effect on the accounting equation is actually pretty easy. Um, cash is an asset and it went up, so assets go up. And then common stock is owner's equity, and um, common stock goes up, which makes owner's equity go up. Liability is not affected. Let's do the next date on June 2nd. We'll do part B first, then part A. Make the journal entry. Paid rent for June. We're paying rent for June at the beginning of June. So what are the two accounts involved? First one is cash because of the word paid. We can tell cash is going down by 375 here because it says we paid 375. The other account involved is prepaid rent. I better spell it out so you can remember. We're paying for the right to occupy this space in the future. That right, the definition is called prepaid rent. So prepaid rent goes up. So first step, identify which accounts are involved. Second step for each account, figure out does it go up or down. Third step is put the accounts in their respective categories. So cash is an asset, prepaid rent is an asset. And then the final step to make the journal entry is use the rules of debit and credit to make the journal entry. How do we make cash and asset go down? We're going to have to credit cash according to the rules. How do we make prepaid rent, which is an asset, go up? We're going to have to debit pre prepaid rent. And I think the amount here was 375. So there's the journal entry. The effect on the accounting equation, part A for this one. Cash is an asset and assets go down. Then prepaid rent is an asset. Assets go up by the same amount. Um, no effect on liabilities, no effect on owner's equity. June 3rd. Part B, figure out which accounts are involved. In this case, in this case, office equipment is one of them. Um, and then not cash because it doesn't say paid. It says purchased on account. So accounts payable is the other one. So office equipment. It goes up in value. Accounts payable is the other account. It goes up in value. Right, our liability goes up. So office equipment is an asset, accounts payable is a liability. Again, go back and look at the rules. Um, how do we make an asset go up? We debit it, so we're going to debit office equipment. For, what was the amount? 2800 And how do we make accounts payable, which is a liability, go up? We're going to credit it. And that's the journal entry. So, I mean, the hardest part of this is figuring out which accounts are involved and if they should go up or down. And then memorizing, you know, for each account, what, what category does it go in, in the dealer acronym. In this case, the first one goes in A and the second one goes in L. 
And then after you've done that, then the rules, you, you've already memorized the rules. That's pretty easy. We just said that office equipment is an asset, and we said it's supposed to go up. So clearly we got to debit office equipment. And then accounts payable is a liability, and we said it has to go up. So clearly we have to credit accounts payable. So that's it makes the journal entry pretty easy when you follow these steps. The effect on the accounting equation also is straightforward. Um, office equipment is an asset, and it went up by uh, 2800 so assets won't go up. And then accounts payable is a liability, and liabilities went up. Owner's equity, no effect. June 6th. Make the journal entry for June 6th. We purchase art materials and other supplies that cost $2,500. We paid $900 down with the remainder due within 30 days. So the accounts involved, if we look at the list here, supplies is the account that would be representing art materials and other supplies. So supplies. And it should go up because we purchased supplies. We got we got more supplies. The dollar value of our supplies is going up. And then I see the word paid here, so definitely cash is involved. And cash is going down by nine hundred because we paid nine hundred dollars of what we owed. And the rest of it, and the rest of it would be sixteen hundred dollars we still owe to the supplier. So dollars. You know, amounts we owe to suppliers for stuff that they've given us is um, called accounts payable. So accounts payable is the other account involved, and that goes up by, it looks like, 1600 So put the accounts into their categories. Supplies is an asset. Cash is an asset. Accounts payable is a liability. And now make the journal entry. How do we make an asset go up? We debit it. So we're going to debit supplies for 2500 How do we make an asset go down? We credit it, so we're going to credit cash for 900 And how do we make accounts payable, which is a liability, go up? We make liabilities go up with credits, so we're going to credit accounts payable for the 1600 Now, you may wonder, some students ask, well, if I have more than one debit or more than one credit in the journal entry, what order do I put them in? And usually the rule of thumb is you put the one with the biggest number first. So technically I should probably um, put the account payable credit on top of the cash credit. And they're both credits because they're both indented to the right relative to the, the supplies debit above them. But I should probably put the account payable one on top of the cash one just because it's a bigger number. But on an exam or anything like that, that won't be an issue. I don't care the order. So this is the answer. For June 6th, Part A, what's the effect on the accounting equation of this transaction? Well, supplies is an asset, and it went up by 2500 So assets are going up by 2500 But then cash is an asset as well, but it went down by 900 so the net effect of these two things, up by 2,500 and down by 900, the net effect is up by 1,600 for the assets. And then accounts payable is a liability, and it goes up by 1,600. So liabilities go up by 1,600. No effect on owner's equity. So the, the effect here of this transaction on the accounting equation is assets go up by 1,600 and liabilities go up by 1,600. Let's do the next one. Um, build clients for services, June 11th. Did we render them? Yeah, build clients for services. So we've done the services and we sent them a bill. So if we've done the services, we've, rec we've, we've earned the revenue. So we have to recognize revenue. So definitely service revenue. Or what do they call it here? Um, service fees earned is what they call the account. So service fees earned, it's the same thing as service revenue, just more descriptive. 
So that this is a revenue account. This is a revenue. <laughs> um, that goes up. And then the other thing that goes up, does our cash go up? Did we receive any cash? No, we didn't. So we must have an account receivable with these customers now. They owe us. So our accounts receivable goes up. Service fees earned is going up. Accounts receivable is going up. Um, this account is a revenue and this account is an asset. So we can make the journal entry. How do we make an, a revenue go up? We credit it. So we're going to credit service fees earned. For what, how much was it? 4750 4, And we're going to debit accounts receivable. For 4750 How do we make an asset go up? We debit it. Every journal entry involves at least one debit and at least one credit. So if you have two accounts that you know are involved and you figured out which one is debited, then the other one has to be credited by a process of elimination. So you can also kind of use that to help you with the journal entries. This is part B for this date. Uh, and then for part A, what's the effect on the accounting equation? Um, assets are going up by 47.50 and revenue is going up by 47.50. How does that affect the accounting equation? And we've gone over this already multiple times. When revenue goes up, that makes retained earnings go up, which makes owner's equity go up. So revenue affects owner's equity eventually. No effect on liabilities, owner's equity up. Uh, June 17th, we'll do the journal entry first, part B. Collected 2,600 from clients on account. So those clients that we build in on June 11th, um, we didn't collect all of the account receivable, but we were collected 2,600 of it. So the two accounts involved are cash, that's going up, and accounts receivable, that's going down. We're collecting their account. That reduces our account receivable with them. Cash is an asset, accounts receivable is an asset. How do we make an asset go up? We debit it. How do we make an asset go down? We credit it. So we're going to debit accounts receivable, I'm sorry, debit cash, credit accounts receivable for the $2,600. There's the journal entry. The effect on the accounting equation, I'm going to start going a little faster now since this is becoming redundant. Both of these are assets, cash goes up, which makes assets go up by $2,600. Accounts receivable goes down, which makes assets go down by $2,600. No effect on liabilities, no effect on owner's equity. That's the effect on the accounting equation right there. There. Next date, um, June 19th. Do part B first. We pay 2000 on account to office equipment company. See the June 3rd transaction. So we didn't pay all of the account that we owe, but we paid off 2000 of it. So the word paid is, you see the word paid, that means cash is involved. So cash, we paid, so cash goes down. Accounts payable is the other account involved, and we paid off part of our account payable, so that goes down. Cash is an asset, accounts payable is a liability. Using the rules of debit and credit, how do we make an asset go down? We credit it, so we're going to credit cash for the $2,000. How do we make a liability go down? We debit the liability to make it go down for $2,000, right? If we go back up here, cash is an asset and we want it to go down, so we credit cash. Accounts payable is a liability and we want it to go down, so we debit it according to the rules. Part A, the effect on the accounting equation, assets went down, liabilities went down, no effect on owner's equity. Let's do the next one. 
June 25th. Do the journal entry first. We gave Emily Holmes, one of our owners, well, our owner, our only owner at this point, we gave her a $750 dividend. So cash is involved. It goes down. From our perspective, cash is involved. And then dividends go up. Cash is an asset. Dividends is a dividend. That's the category it's in in the dealer acronym. How do we make an asset go down? We credit it for, what was it, 750? How do we make a dividend go up? We debit it. Again, debits are always above the accounts that are credited and the accounts that are credited are below and the end and to the right. That's the journal entry. Effect on the accounting equation. Well, cash is an asset and it went down. No effect on liabilities. Dividends affects owner's equity. When dividends goes up, that makes retained earnings go down, which makes owner's equity go down. And that again is summarized up here again. When dividends go up, retained earnings goes down, which makes owner's equity go down. June 30th, two things happen. Journal entry for the first one, we paid the utility bill. So cash is involved. And cash is going down, it looks like. And then utility expense, I guess, because if we look at the accounts that are going to be used in these transactions, you see utilities expense is one of them. And we haven't used it yet. So here, now we're using it, utilities expense. Um, that goes up. We have to recognize an expense when we incur it, and we incur it whenever we derive the benefit from using the asset. So by the end of the month, the lights have been on the whole month. We've definitely benefited from having electricity. Therefore, we've incurred utilities expense. Even if we didn't pay for it, then we still have to put the utilities expense. So what categories are these are these accounts in? Cash is an asset. Utilities expense is an, is an expense in the dealer acronym. How do we make an asset go down? We credit it. So we're going to credit cash. How do we make an expense go up? According to the rules, we debit it. And the amount was what? 525. So we're going to debit utilities expense for 525. Credit cash for 525. This is the journal entry. Part A, the effect on the accounting equation. Uh, we made assets go down, so that reduces assets. Liability is not affected. And when expenses go up, that makes retained earnings go down, which makes owner's equity go down. That, again, is summarized up here. When utilities expense goes up, that makes retained earnings go down, which makes owner's equity go down. Right? And then the final transaction that happens on June 30th, um, paid salaries for June. It's very similar to the utilities. Cash is involved, cash goes down. And then salaries, expenses involved. And that's going up. I mean, the only account we haven't used yet is salaries, expense. So that's got to be this last one here. And... The journal entry is our, our cash is an asset, salaries, expenses, is an expense. And the entry is going to look just like this one. We're going to debit salaries, expense. You debit this expense to make it go up. And then you're going to credit the asset cash to make it go down for what? $2,750. And the effect on the accounting equation of this transaction is, is exactly the same effect as the previous transaction. Assets go down. Cash goes down by $2,750. Liability is not affected. 
and owner's equity goes down by 2750 whenever the expense goes up by 2750 All right, let's see if there's any any other exercises or problems we want to do here. I think that's pretty much it. These other exercises and or problems kind of just test your knowledge of this same material but just in different ways, but it's it's all the same as what we've been doing pretty much. I'm trying to see if there's I guess the only thing that we didn't really do, if we go back to these transactions, what it could have asked us to do something else in this problem. Go back here. It could have asked us to keep track of the T accounts throughout this month of June and then ask us for the ending balance in each of the T accounts that was involved in June. So to do that, it didn't ask us for that, but if it had asked us for that, I'll show you how to do that. So we would have to take cash, that's one T account that was involved, make a T account for it, and then go back up to every transaction which involved cash. Like the first transaction here on June 1st, we debited cash for 8000 The transaction on June 2nd, we credited cash for 375 So we got to go put those entries in the T account. So the beginning balance in cash, beginning of June, before starting, or at the beginning of the month, the beginning balance is zero. And we know that because it says, if we go back to the problem, and I've, I've gone past it at this point, but this was the first month of their business, right? June 1st, the company started. So the balance in all the accounts at the beginning of their business is zero. And then on June 1st, we received the $8,000 cash from Emily Holmes in exchange for giving her stock. And then on June 2nd, right, that was the second thing that happened with the cash T account. We paid rent for the month of June, 375. So we credited cash for 375 right here. What's the next thing that happened in the cash T account? Um, we so cash was not involved on the third. It wasn't involved. It was involved on the sixth. We paid nine hundred dollars towards the supplies that we bought. So we credited cash for nine hundred on June sixth. Next time cash is involved is on the eleventh. No, the seventeenth. We. We received $2,600 from the customers who were paying off their account with us on June 17th. So we debited cash for $2,600. And then the next time cash was involved is on June 19th. We paid $2,000 of our account off. So we credited cash for $2,000 on the 19th of June. And then on the 25th of June, we paid a dividend, 750, so we credited cash for 750. And then on June 30th, we paid the utility bill and we paid the salaries. So we credited cash for 525 and then 2750. And so at the end of the month, what's the balance in the cash T account? Well, we know the balance is going to be a debit debit balance, right? Because cash has a normal debit balance. So we may as well put over here, double underline. And then we just need to compute what's the ending balance. So to do that, you just come over here. And we'll take our 8000 plus our 2600 so those are the additions to the account this period the beginning balance was zero so I, I need to add the beginning balance but it was zero so I didn't add zero and then we need to subtract 375 subtract 900 subtract 2000 subtract 750 subtract 525 
whoops, and subtract 2,750 to get an ending balance of 3,300. So the balance as of June 30th is $3,300. So the problem could have could have asked us to do this for every account that we used in the problem. Not only for cash, but for accounts receivable, do the same thing. And I just showed you how to do it for one of the accounts. The cash is the one used in most of the transactions, so it's the most active account. You're going to be doing a lot more stuff. Um, so the process of what we were doing, we were making journal entries. This is a journal entry. And then what is this right over here? This is called posting the journal entries to the T accounts. So you can imagine the company has two books. One book they make the journal entries in. That book is called the journal. They make all the journal entries in. And then another book which has all the T accounts and the posting to those T accounts. That's called the general ledger. So all the T accounts with the posts with the journal entries posted to the T accounts is called the general ledger. And then the actual journal entries themselves, journal entries themselves are, are made in the journal. All right, I think that concludes this video. Um, I hope it was helpful for you.